Thank you. Um, a few years back, I had read about Dr. Hernandez and I took a risk and see, tried to see if he would come into my class because I know he's very busy. And he accepted and came in, gave up his day, uh, met the people in the class, told an amazing story about his life to the point where I had tears in my eyes. I don't know if he remembers, but he came over and hugged me because it's, I was so moved by the story and I actually feel honored. I mean that sincerely. I feel honored just to be able to introduce him. And uh, I'm not gonna say any more because he'll be doing the talking. Dr. Fernandez, please. Well, thank you, Bruce. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna share my screen now. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. Uh, thank you, Bruce, uh, for your kind words. And uh, I'm gonna talk about how to prevent a heart attack using some simple uh, techniques and maneuvers. And I'm, uh, I'm also gonna share a little bit about uh, my life. So it's gonna be a, a little bit mixed. Um, the, uh, first of all, I have uh, no conflicts of interest. Uh, <clears throat> Actually, I do have a conflict of interest in, and that conflict is that I'm really passionate about this topic, uh, the topic of nutrition and how through nutrition, you can uh, change your life, you can change your risks in terms of uh, preventing a heart attack and actually even reversing a heart attack or reversing some of these chronic conditions that really affects so many people. You know, stuff like diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, and uh, cerebrovascular disease and just so many other conditions. This is a picture of Dr. Kim Williams, who used to be the president of the American College of Cardiology. And, and he put this quote up that I think is interesting, that there are gonna be two kinds of cardiologists in the future, vegans and those who uh, haven't really read the, uh, the data. But uh, before I start, I just wanna sort of tell you about uh, a little bit about my family. Um, because part of the issue about some of the things that I'll be discussing today is the why. You know, why do we do some of the things we do? Why change the way we eat when we're 50, when we're 60, when we're 70, or even when we're older? Uh, and I think a lot of times it relates to some of the things that are important in my life. So I have a picture here of the three people that are most important in my life. Um, uh, my daughter, who's actually uh, currently at, uh, in journalism school at Columbia. Uh, my wife who has been with me through the good days and the bad days. And my son who's wearing my uh, Boy Scout uniform when, when I got to be an Eagle Scout. Uh, interestingly, uh, related to what I do, uh, my son, when he was about this age, one day we're having a conversation, father to son, and my, my son is very creative, very imaginative. And he looked at me and he said, you know, daddy, you have the best job in the world. Whenever you're stressed out, you can just get a knife and a saw and you can just cut into people's chests. So I said, well, hold on, Brandon, hold on. Uh, you're right, that is what I do. Uh, every day I have this incredible honor and privilege to literally get into the chest of my patients and fix their hearts, fix the arteries that are not working, fix the, the valves that are not working well. Uh, but I do it not out of stress, I do it because uh, it's the way that I can help people. And, uh, you know, over the last few years, I've discovered that there are other ways to help people. And that's by bringing some of the information that I'm about to tell you uh, today. And, and that's why we're all here mostly. Uh, the, uh, I was asked by Bruce to tell you a little bit about uh, my story. Uh, and, you know, it just happens that when I was 13 years old, I found myself in this tiny boat in a tiny island in the Bahamas, uh, waiting to cross through a corner of the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, my parents were already in America, living as undocumented immigrants. Um, and I found myself in this tiny little boat uh, one night, uh, a midnight crossing with 10 other undocumented immigrants. Uh, it was darkness everywhere. We all thought we were going to die. And uh, I still remember the sound of the boat going up and then coming down, crashing against the waves. Uh, everyone was sick, everyone was praying. And at that moment, 
what was going through my mind was not really some of the incredible, wonderful things that my parents had promised us we would find in America, but it was some of the simple things. Uh, and what was going through my mind was just asking God to just give me one more uh, moment so that I could see my mother again, so that I could touch her and feel her, her face and, and just see her again, because I hadn't seen her for several years. We, we were lucky. We made it to Miami where we met friends of my parents, who then put us up on a, on a plane uh, to see my parents. And that's the picture you see on your uh, right upper uh, hand corner. That was our first picture with, with uh, my mother. Uh, interestingly, they had told us that the trip was not over yet and that we had to be careful that when we saw our parents, we had to pretend that this was just a regular meeting. And I still remember walking down the corridor to meet our parents and, and then we see them crying and we started running and, and celebrating and hugging each other because uh, we hadn't seen them for, for such a long time. Um, uh, and then, you know, we, we made it to America, a uh, wonderful, incredible country. And, and I tell people that, you know, as an, as an immigrant, I love my native country, but I adore America. I am so grateful for everything this country has given me. Uh, and in fact, that night, I still remember because everything was so incredible. You know, the lights of New York City, uh, every, even the traffic lights seemed incredible. But that night, what was most special to me was when my mother was showing us around and we got to the kitchen and she was showing us the refrigerator. And right in the middle, there was a little basket with apples. And uh, it was green apples, red apples, and she showed us everything. But I, I, just, I just remember the picture of that little basket with the apples because that night we went to sleep and me and my brother couldn't fall asleep I'm thinking about the apples because in, Co in Colombia an apple is a luxury item uh, every time my abuelita had an apple she would cut it into little wedges and we would all get a little wedge uh, not the entire apple so we actually got up in the middle of the night and, and asked my mother if we could have an apple uh, and uh, and she started crying and and at that moment, she told us that, yeah, you can have anything you want, uh, and, and this is your house. But it was just that realization that we were physically together, but there was so much work that needed to be done for us to come again uh, together as a family. And uh, uh, I've been fortunate in my life and uh, was able to work real hard and get accepted to Princeton and then Harvard. Uh, and when I share my story with kids, I always tell them that one of the things that really changed my life was this idea of working in tiny little steps. Because the beginning was hard. You know, we were, me and my brother were always getting into trouble. Other kids would call us refugees. They would tell us to go back to our own country. And, and uh, to the point where the principal called my mother uh, for a special meeting and, and he warned her that we were gonna be suspended from school. And my mother broke down, she started crying. And uh, at that point, when I was 14 years old, and I had to change my life around. One of the things I decided to do was to get a job uh, and to get a job delivering the newspaper. But when I decided to get that job, I decided that I wasn't just gonna go through the motions of getting the job. I decided I wanted to be the best newspaper carrier in America. And, and it worked. It worked because after about a year of delivering the newspaper, I was selected as the newspaper carrier of the month which, uh, uh, you know, I came out in the newspaper, my picture came out in the newspaper and my parents were just so proud. My, my mother cut out the little paper article and she put it in her purse and she would show it to everyone. <laughs> Even people she didn't know, she would just stop people in the street and, and say, look, 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 my son, newspaper carrier of the month. And like I tell kids, you know, it may seem insignificant, but the same, energy, the same enthusiasm, the same mindset that I used to become the newspaper carrier of the month is what I used all throughout my education, whether it was becoming the valedictorian of my high school, whether it was doing well at Princeton to receive the highest honor that is given to an undergraduate student, whether it was at Harvard, Harvard Medical School, or even right now as a heart surgeon to do the best job that I can possibly do for my patients. They're the same uh, energy, the same techniques that, I, that I've used all my life. Uh, 
So I've written two books that I put here, the, the titles, Undocumented, which talks about my experience in America as an undocumented immigrant. And the second book, which was recently published, uh, is a book for more for, your, for a younger audience. And it talks about the power of reading and how books and, and, and reading and an education was really what changed my life. You know, I think so many kids this age focus on athletics and sports and other things, but I think if, if kids focus more on reading and books and an education, I think it would really change a lot of uh, kids. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't know if you know who this is, but this is a lady that I really admire, uh, uh, Diane Nyad. Uh, and the three things that she said, I think have a, have a lot to do with what I'm about to talk about you uh, today. Uh, she was the first woman to swim from Cuba to Florida. Uh, and she did it not when she was 20 years old, not 30, not 40. She did it when she was 65 years old. It wasn't her first attempt. It wasn't her second. It was her fifth attempt. So she had, she had failed multiple times. And at the age of 65, she was able to accomplish this that no one else has been able to accomplish. And when she got out of the water in the Keys, she said three things. First one, it's never too late to accomplish your dreams. Uh, never give up. And it requires a team. Even though it may look like a lonely sport swimming from over there to Florida, it requires a team. And all these three principles apply to nutrition and to making some of the changes that we need to make to change our life around. It's never too late. There are people who are struggling with diabetes, with heart disease, in their 70s, in their 80s, with obesity, and they can still change. Uh, it's never too late to make the changes you need to make. Uh, never giving up because it's not easy. It requires commitment, it requires failure, it requires just a, a long time to really be able to succeed. And it requires a team, it requires sometimes the help from, from your family. And like you would see in my case, it required the help from my wife and, and my kids as well. Uh, so this is a picture uh, I was speaking to Bruce actually before the conference uh, and I used to weight almost uh, actually above 200 pounds and with the changes that I made I was able to lose weight without trying to lose weight the weight just came off and I was able to do some of the stuff that I used to do when I was younger uh, which was running for example and this is a picture of me running the, uh, the New York City half marathon uh, about two years ago actually last year it was canceled because of the pandemic. Actually, before I forget, uh, I, I should just remind you that, you know, to continue to take care of your body, continue to take care of yourselves, continue to protect yourself with, with the masks, with uh, social distancing, with uh, washing your hands, uh, you know, multiple times a day, and, and not touching your, your, your face, your, your eye, particularly your eyes, your nose, and your mouth uh, with your hands, because these are some of the things that we know work to prevent the chances of you getting infected with COVID. Not 100%, you know, nothing in life is 100%, uh, but they really reduce the rates of infection. So this is a picture of me uh, in the operating room about to start uh, surgery. Uh, the patient is uh, right here. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we do when we do surgery, actually when we do any surgical procedure in America, is that right before the surgery starts, we do something called a timeout. And as part of the timeout, we go over to some, some of the equipment that uh, we're gonna need during the surgery. We make sure that we're operating on the right part of the body. And we just go through a list of things that are required before the nurse gives you the, uh, the scalpel. Uh, and uh, so we do this and uh, I always add my own two little things. One is that I do a little breathing exercise where uh, just on my own, I, I go through, a, through an exercise of just being aware of my body, being aware of my breathing. Uh, and I, so I breathe in for about five seconds, a deep breath uh, uh, through your nose, uh, using the diaphragm, using the abdominal muscles to really get a full breath and then hold it for three, four seconds and then let it out for another five seconds. But just being aware of your breath is something that really allows you to uh, be in the moment at that particular moment and be aware that you're about to do something of significance, which in this case is open heart surgery. 
I also say a little prayer uh, on my own. Uh, and, and that little prayer is just a simple prayer where I ask God to just give me the energy, uh, the power, and the knowledge, uh, and the patience to be able to perform this surgery because uh, even though I do this every day, uh, this is probably one of the most significant parts for my patients uh, going through the process of open heart surgery. Um, so uh, in terms of exercise and the significance of exercise, there are two books that I recommend to people that are just very basic books on, on the uh, power of exercise. The first one was by John Roddy. Uh, he was a psychiatrist in Boston uh, in the 1980s. And in his clinical practice, he started seeing a lot of patients that were coming to his practice with depression, with psychosis, with inability to focus. And uh, during this time, it was a lot of people that had been exercising, but because of some sort of injury, they weren't able to exercise. And he made that connection that exercise was good uh, for your mental health. Uh, and he quoted the term that doing exercise is almost like taking two drugs at the same time. Uh, Prozac to control your mood and uh, Ritalin to control and improve your concentration. And I think that since then, there have been a lot of neuroscientists who have done experiments to show that there are chemical changes in the brain that, sh that, that mimic uh, the, effect, the effect of these drugs uh, in terms of your uh, mental health being. In fact, one of them is Wendy Suzuki, who's a neuroscientist at NYU, uh, and she has shown that there are parts of the brain, like the hypothalamus, which actually grow even in adults uh, with exercise. And she's also been able to show in some of her students that when they exercise, they actually do better in her classes. Uh, so now we're going to concentrate a little bit in, in the heart, because uh, that's a, what I think you all want to hear. Uh, and we're going to go over a heart attack. Uh, as you all probably know. Dr. Fernandez, somebody asked if you could speak a little louder. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about a, a heart attack and the significance of a heart attack and, and what it is and how to diagnose it and how to prevent it. And even more importantly, how to reverse it. If you have factors that make you a risk of a heart attack, is it possible to reverse those risks? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to tell you some of the things that you can do to reverse uh, the risk of you having a heart attack. So a heart attack occurs when one of the arteries that delivers blood to the surface of the heart, there are two main arteries, the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. And when, this, when there are blockages in those arteries so that the muscle is not getting enough blood supply, enough oxygen, enough nutrients, then you can get a heart attack. Uh, some of the uh, symptoms that patients can have in general is what they describe as chest pressure. So sometimes you ask patients and they tell you that they don't have pain, but they have a pressure sensation in their chest. Some patients describe it as an elephant sitting on their chest because that muscle, again, is not getting enough blood supply. Very interestingly, there are patients who have no symptoms, and the first symptom can be a massive heart attack. And especially in women, there are many women who have what we call atypical symptoms, meaning that they either don't have pain or they have symptoms that, for example, related to weakness, to fatigue, sometimes depression, sometimes pain, which is in the back, in the neck, sometimes even in the gums, uh, and they can be related to your heart. So the question is how to know whether something is related to the heart. Well, when you see your doctor, the doctor is going to go over the symptoms and the risk factors. Uh, the first test is probably going to be what we call an EKG. That's the electrocardiogram, where you go to the doctor's office and they put some electrodes on your chest and then they look at the electrical patterns of the heart to see if, if there are changes that can uh, uh, sort of represent that you may be at risk for having a heart attack. The other one is the echocardiogram which is a test where they put some gel on your chest and they look with ultrasound, they get some pictures and, and it tells them uh, how your heart looks, how the heart works, the valves, and whether your heart is strong or weak. Uh, 
And the last one is what we call the angiogram. I skipped the cardiac CT scan. I'll tell you about that in a second. But the angiogram, uh, and I want you to know this because I'm going to be, talk be talking about angiograms later on. The angiogram is the only test that can tell you 100% whether you have blockages in your coronary arteries or not. There is no other test that is as good as the angiogram. So you're probably asking in your mind, well, Dr. Fernandez, how come we don't do an angiogram on everyone so that we know whether you, you can have a heart attack or not. And the reason we don't do an angiogram on everyone is that this is an invasive test where you go to the hospital, they put a little catheter in your femoral artery through the groin or in your radial artery through the wrist, and they put a little catheter that goes into the coronary arteries and they put some dye and then they take pictures of your coronary arteries. But this test is invasive and there are some people who can actually die from just the test because it is an invasive test. Very rare, but it can happen. So over the last, probably I would say the last five years or so, we've been able to do cardiac CT scans. The cardiac CT scan is actually a really good test. It approximates the sensitivity of the angiogram and it's getting better and better. And this is a test where you go to the hospital, they put you in a machine and they take pictures of your heart. And they can also see the coronary arteries and they can determine whether you're at risk of having these blockages or not. There's another test which actually is also very good, very cheap, anyone can have it. It's called the calcium score. And if you get a calcium score that is very low, it really can put you at risk of you being uh, uh, sort of heart attack uh, proof. Uh, but if the calcium score is very high, then you should probably have one of the other tests. So uh, how do we treat uh, coronary artery disease? Or how do we treat these blockages in the arteries that go to the heart? Uh, the first one, of course, is prevention. Uh, and we'll talk about prevention uh, for the rest of the talk. Uh, there are also ways to open up these blockages with what we call stents. Uh, these are put in by invasive cardiologists. And the other one is what I do, which is open heart surgery, which is the most invasive way of, of dealing with this, and which was the, what my son was talking about, about uh, opening up the chest. Uh, we uh, put the patient on the heart lung machine, and we do a bypass where we take vein from the leg, and we take an artery from the chest wall, and we use it to do the bypass. And reversal, you know, can these blockages be reversed? So we'll talk about that in a little while. This is what I do almost every day. It's called coronary artery bypass grafting. And we take an artery from the chest wall or we take vein from the leg and we use it to bypass the blockages. I think a hundred years from now, medical students are gonna be sitting in a medical school class and they're gonna ask the professor, wait, wait, doc, wait, professor, they used to take a vein from the leg and put it in the heart, because I think we're gonna come up with better ways to treat coronary artery disease. So this is what causes all these problems, and probably not just in the heart, but also in the carotid arteries that go up to your brain causing strokes. But this is also the cause of many other problems around the body, including erectile dysfunction, including chronic back pain, just including, you know, including people that have what we call claudication, which is when they, when they don't get enough blood supply to their legs and they can't walk even a few feet because they get pain in their legs. And it's the atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, and as you can see, we know some of the components of this plaque, including uh, different sort of cellular components, including cholesterol, including calcium, but we don't know exactly how it's caused. Now, when this plaque grows and occludes the coronary arteries, you can get a heart attack. But that currently is thought to only cause about 10% of heart attacks. Most heart attacks now are caused by some of these plaques in the coronary arteries rupturing. So they can even happen in plaques that are not that big, like 20, 30% plaques. Now here, I've put a picture, an angiogram. On the left, you see a deceased artery, and this artery is an artery where there's a blockage here. 
And on the right side, you see the same artery in the same patient, uh, almost two years later after a plant-based nutrition. So some people can say, whoa, this, is, this was a miracle. Uh, or, or in reality, what it is, is an intervention in your nutrition that caused this. But in my view, as a cardiothoracic surgeon, even if you have only one patient in the history of humanity where this happened because of an intervention, to me, this is significant because this is a, a condition that if you tell most doctors out there whether this can happen, they probably will tell you that it can happen. And we have evidence now of hundreds of patients where we have angiographic data that shows that plaque can be reversed. Can we reverse diabetes, right? Uh, I don't know if any of you have diabetes, but when you have diabetes and you go to the doctor, basically what we do with diabetes is that we manage diabetes. Right? There are two types of diabetes. There's type one, which happens when you're young. There's type two, which happens later on in life when you're an adult. And type two is believed to be caused by a resistance, resistance to insulin. And that resistance becomes so high that later on people have to stop, start taking insulin. Most people feel, think that diabetes is caused by an excess of sugar. Uh, and most of the evidence right now shows that the real cause of type two diabetes is an accumulation of, of fats or lipids inside the muscle cell or the cells of your liver that actually interferes with the way insulin is processed and therefore that insulin signaling doesn't work and those receptors that allow glucose to get into the muscle cell don't open and therefore the glucose stays in your blood and it raises your, your, your uh, sugars. Now there are many other conditions that are helped by plant-based nutrition. I, I'm not gonna speak about any of this uh, right now just because of, of, of uh, time, uh, but you know, allergies, for example. Uh, allergies are related to some sort of inflammatory process in your body. And one of the things that happened to me, for example, was that I, I had terrible allergies uh, all my life, so that the months of May and June I almost couldn't go outside. In fact, it was so bad that I, I would take every medication known to men, Allegra, Certic, multiple uh, inhalers, and, and uh, you know, we, we would have to keep all the windows in my house closed. Uh, I would get to work and park near the hospital so that I could take as many little breaths as possible before actually going inside. And my allergies have, gone, uh, have completely been healed. Uh, since I changed my nutrition. Uh, now, you would think that this is new stuff, new information, but this has been around for ages. In fact, Hippocrates, uh, 2,500 years ago, said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about those decisions that we make in the supermarket and that we make in the kitchen and how they're related to our health. I'll just skip this. Uh, so the question is, can plaque be reversed? There have been a few pioneers in this field of plant-based nutrition. One of them is Dean Ornish uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, and in fact, he was one of the first people to use angiograms and to use invasive tests to show that plaque can be reversed. And he actually published his studies in 1990 and 1995 uh, in JAMA and in The Lancet showing that plaque can actually be reversed. So I'm gonna show you some of the data. So on the graph on the left, you can see one of the prospective controlled randomized studies where he put people on a plant-based nutrition and he showed that after one year, there was some benefit in terms of, of, of the diameter of the plaque in their arteries. And after five years, that, that uh, was even better. 37.3% uh, decrease 
as opposed to a natural increase in the patients that were just in a regular, uh, what we call the regular American diet. Now, I have to tell you that in the past, when I saw my patients, I always recommended everything in moderation. I would tell them just eat a little bit of this, a little bit of each of the four food groups, the way I saw it at that time. And if they did that in combination with a little bit of exercise, that they would be healthy. But then I began to see, and after looking at some of this data, that that recommendation is really what causes coronary artery disease and some of the problems that affect people. And Dr. Ornish was also able to show that, and the way I tell patients is that they don't have to change their diet completely. So I tell them that there are two ways of eating. We have uh, what I call uh, the regular American diet, everything in moderation, uh, it's right here. And then on the other spectrum, we have the diet, which is whole food, plant-based nutrition that is low in oils, which reverses heart disease. So they don't have to necessarily be there, but the closer they are, the better they're gonna be and the better they're gonna feel. Uh, and he was able to show that depending on how much commitment you make, then that also determines how much benefit you're gonna get. Uh, so I tell patients, for example, if they, because if you think about the American diet, we eat meat, we eat animal products three times a day. Uh, you have your bacon, egg and cheese in the morning, then you have your ham sandwich for lunch, and then you have your steak at night. Uh, and and if, you are, if you're able to decrease that to maybe just having meat uh, two or three times a week, it can, it can actually, there can be some benefit to that. Uh, this is a, a graph from uh, some data from uh, Norway uh, during World War II. Uh, and Norway always had a very high incidence of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. And that cardiovascular disease actually went down when the Germans invaded and took away all the dairy and all the cows. Uh, and uh, it kept going down, kept going down. And then uh, once the war was over and they were able to get all their cattle back, it started uh, going back up again. Um, the, uh, there's a study called the China Study, uh, which is a study uh, by Dr. Colin T. Campbell. Uh, he's a biochemist at Cornell University. Uh, and he was able to show that in cow's milk, the biggest component of cow's milk is a protein called casein that has been highly associated with uh, different types of cancer. And in fact, in experimental models, he has been able to show that casein uh, can actually, and this is a data from transgenic mice. These are mice that have tumors, that if he feeds them, feeds them a, a diet high in casein, that the tumors are torn down, and if he feeds them a diet, and then he stops the casein, and the tumors are actually go off, and then the, the tumors go up again when he feeds them the casein again. So um, these, are, these are experimental animals, but it shows that even in experimental animals, this casein protein uh, can be dangerous to them. Now, uh, there is also some epidemiologic data. Uh, there's a book called The Blue Zones by Dan Buettner, uh, who went to five regions around the world that have the highest number of, of people who live above 100 years old. And it's not just living above 100 years old, but it's living above 100 year, years old and being able to enjoy your life, meaning being active members of society. Uh, some of them still have jobs. Uh, they uh, go around and, and they, they're part of their family, their community, and they're, they're uh, you know, very, uh, uh, they're people that actually are still enjoying life. And the five zones are Loma Linda in California, Nicoya in Costa Rica, uh, Sardinia in Italy, uh, Ikaria in Greece, and uh, Okinawa in Japan. And he went and he studied what are these people doing to reach those ages. And here are some of the things he found. Uh, they, uh, they don't necessarily exercise heavily, but they move naturally, meaning that they're, they're very active. Uh, they also have a, the right outlook in life. Uh, they, uh, they actually have, they're very, they have very strong uh, connections to their family, to other groups in their communities, and they eat wisely. 
So I'm gonna just sort of briefly show you some of the stuff that they eat in the blue zones. And mostly, basically, they are diets which have very low animal products. Even the Mediterranean diet, right? We always, probably one of the most common diets that you hear about in the United States, the Mediterranean diet works not because of the olive oil, um, but it works because it, it is very uh, high in foods that are not processed, uh, and it's also very low in animal products. Uh, and uh, Okinawa, for example, uh, where there are also a, a high number of people that live above 100, uh, the, their consumption of fish, meat, and poultry is very low. That only makes up 2% of their diet. Most of their diet, as you can see right here, is sweet potatoes. So the more sweet potatoes you eat, the better you're going to feel and the better you're going to be. Uh, and again, most of the food in the, in, the, in the blue zones comes from this food uh, elements right here, uh, including you know, whole food plant-based diet, uh, very little meat, uh, legumes, whole grains, uh, and uh, vegetables and fruits. There was another study where they looked at the uh, um, people that live above 100 years in China, and again, their consumption of meat is only 2%. Again, sweet potatoes it, it consists of most of their diet. Now, there are hundreds of studies, and some of them with mixed results. Uh, uh, and you probably, at the end of the talk, you may think that I'm just showing you the results that show the benefits of, benefits of plant-based diet, uh, and I'll address that uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but this is a study which actually was just published recently uh, where they looked at, uh, at women who are very athletic and they took 56 uh, healthy, young, lean, physically active women actually with very low BMIs of around 23 because they're very active and they compared them for two years. Uh, some of them were vegan and the half of them were vegan and the other half had a healthy diet. They were omnivore, but they had a very healthy diet. And they had a lot of similarities in terms of their physical activity levels, in terms of their basmati, uh, basmati index, uh, but there were some, actually some significant differences. Uh, one of them was that the vegan group had a higher VO2 max. That's the amount of oxygen, oxygen that you can consume when you're doing heavy exercise. And they also had a, a, a very, uh, di a, you know, a difference in terms of the so maximum endurance time to heavy exercise. So all these were positive results for the women that actually were active and that were uh, consuming a, a healthy uh, plant-based nutrition. This was what we called a meta-analysis, which is, these are studies, and I'm not a particular fan of meta-analysis, uh, but this is, these are studies where they take hundreds of studies and they try to compare them by looking at all the risk factors uh, and taking that into account. And in most meta-analysis, uh, it shows that the more animal or the more plant protein that you eat, the more healthy you're gonna be. And that relates to uh, all-cause mortality, to cardiovascular disease, to cancer, and to just a lot of other different conditions. Uh, this is one of the pioneers of plant, whole food plant-based nutrition, uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, uh, who is a general surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and he's pioneered this uh, whole food plant-based nutrition, and he's the one that has those angiograms, over, over 200 patients with angiograms that show plaque reversal, and that really, uh, I think there's no data stronger than an angiogram that shows plaque reversal in the heart. Now, there are many other diets that are familiar to probably many of you out there that have some benefit in, in terms of uh, losing weight. Uh, the Atkins diet, the South Beach diet, the keto diet, the paleo diet. Uh, Dr. Atkins, you know, all these diets basically are diets that are very high in protein, uh, very high in matter to high fat, and very low 
carbohydrates. Uh, they also have lower processed foods, and some of them can be helpful to lose weight, but over the long term, none of these diets has been shown to reverse heart disease or to reverse the chronic conditions uh, that I just told you about. In fact, Dr. Atkins uh, ended up dying of heart failure and heart disease because of, of his way of uh, eating. One of the most common questions in terms of whole food plant-based nutrition is, well, where do you get your protein? Uh, and because, you know, we always think that we only get protein from meat, or from chicken or from fish or, or from milk. Uh, but that's not the case. And in fact, some of the biggest animals in nature, uh, the manatee, for example, the gorilla, uh, uh, horses, uh, the buffalo, just many animals out in nature, all they eat is plants. Uh, you happen to be at Disney before the pandemic, and in Epcot, they had an exhibit of manatees. Uh, so I, I was asking the lady what they feed the manatee in the aquarium, and the manatee only eats 100 pounds of lettuce a day. And from, because we always think of lettuce as not having protein, but it actually does. And the manatee, all they eat is the lettuce, and from that lettuce, they get all the protein that they need. But in general, protein in the plants is very healthy. Uh, you know, a protein really is a combination of amino acids, and there are 20 amino acids. Nine of those amino acids are what we call essential amino acids. These are amino acids that the body can make, but we have to get them from what we eat. And plants have all those nine amino acids, uh, including, you know, particular legumes, uh, beans, lentils, peas, uh, whole grains have a lot of protein as well. And all that amino acids that we need in our diet can come from plants. Now, a vegan diet or a whole food plant-based diet uh, are different. Uh, and in fact, a vegan diet uh, can be unhealthy. Uh, if all you eat, for example, are, uh, you know, beer, potato chips, Oreo cookies, which I actually like and, and I try to, to avoid them as much as possible. Uh, but if you, all you eat is processed uh, foods that are vegan, uh, your diet is not gonna be healthy and you can end up with some of the same problems as if you were eating uh, meat and other uh, animal products. So the diet that I recommend is what I call a whole food plant-based nutrition that is low in oils. Uh, now, there, there are other benefits be, for a whole food plant-based diet that I can get into in addition to uh, you know, mortality, losing weight, feeling better. Uh, there are benefits for the planet. Uh, it is estimated that the uh, uh, emission of uh, greenhouse gases is about one-tenth with a whole food plant-based diet as opposed to an animal-based diet. And in fact, uh, the uh, na natural gases uh, that would be reduced if, if the planet went on a whole food plant-based diet uh, would outweigh the benefits of all forms of transportation combined. Uh, and of course, there's the ethical aspect in terms of the treatment of animals. And, and I can tell you that this is not something that entered my mind in the past, and I never really talked about it but it's something that has really uh, sort of come into my consciousness as I've been able to make the changes that I needed to make. Uh, you're probably gonna ask me about supplements, and uh, the only supplement that I recommend to people is vitamin B12. And in fact, everyone should probably take vitamin B12. Uh, it, is, it is something that is important for your nerves, for your nervous system, and for your red blood cells. So anyone who's not eating meat should take definitely a vitamin B12 supplement, and there are many that are uh, available out there. Uh, you know, the way we get vitamin B12 is from uh, microorganisms that are in the soil, and that's how they get into the animal, and then we eat the animal meat, and that's how people get the very small amounts that we need for the nervous system and for the production of red blood cells. 
So if you have a supplement, uh, there's not going to be any problem of, uh, of, uh, with, with your nervous system or production of red blood cells. There are some people that recommend other supplements, but this is the only one that you really need, in, in my opinion. Uh, this is the only picture that I want you to remember today. I know I've told you already about several studies, uh, but again, it's, it's, it's an angiogram. It's an angiogram that shows plaque reversal. And this is a real angiogram. This is actually uh, of a patient who was a colleague of Dr. Uh, Caldwell Esselstyn. Uh, that patient happened to be uh, a surgeon, one of his uh, colleagues, and he had just done uh, a surgery. He was dictating the case and he started feeling pressure in his chest. He was very young, he was only in his 40s, didn't have any risk factors for coronary artery disease uh, because he was at the Cleveland Clinic. They took him right away into the cath lab uh, where he went into cardiac arrest, they had to do CPR, they were able to get him back. But then he had this blockage which was very long. This artery is called the left anterior descending artery. And for this kind of artery, there's nothing we can do Technically, you can put a stent because the blockage is very long, and you also can't uh, you can't do a bypass because the bypass would not work because the blockage is very distal in the coronary artery. So this patient actually went back and spoke to Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, and he went on a whole food plant based diet. And uh, two years later, they repeated the angiogram, and you can see that the artery is completely clean. I can tell you that if I was a heart patient, if I had blockages in my coronary arteries, and I saw this picture, even from one patient, I, I think I would make the changes. And that's why I am passionate about this. That's why I feel like I should, this is something that I should tell everyone. And, I, 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 and, and, and that's why I'm here today to tell you this information. Uh, because I think this is powerful information is, is something that you can see uh, and it's something that you can call it a miracle uh, uh, but it's something that I think happened because this person was able to make the changes that they needed to make to make their coronary arteries better and since then we know the physiology of why this happens with plant-based nutrition and uh, uh, I think this is really great news for everyone that has coronary artery disease. In fact, uh, uh, President Clinton, who many of you know had a really terrible diet when he was president, ended up having coronary artery disease. He ended up getting a quadruple bypass surgery. Uh, very quickly after that, some of the grafts failed. He required more stents and he wasn't looking good. You know, he was having chest pain, he was having a lot of problems and he ended up uh, the only thing that was able to help him is when he went to see Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn and he was able to change his diet and now he's doing much better. So I'll just share with you a couple of minutes about my own particular story and how I was able to make the changes that I needed to make. Uh, and it all happened not uh, sort of because this is something that I was planning, but I happened to be the medical editor of a, of a magazine and about five years ago, I was asked to, uh, to ask uh, one of the uh, 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 letters for, for the magazine, and I decided to do it on, on a heart-healthy diet. And the more I looked, the more I researched, I kept coming back on all this information about plaque reversal from whole food plant-based nutrition. Uh, I had never sort of, this, this is not something I learned in medical school. This is not something that all doctors learn in medical school. Uh, this is not something that, that we just really talk about in the, in the medical field. Uh, but this was my typical diet. This plate that you, over here, you see over here was one of my favorite plates. It's called La Bandeja Paisa. It's like the typical plate from Medellin, Colombia. It has uh, beans. It has this part over here called chicharron, which has all the layers of the back of the pig, uh, including the skin the subcutaneous fat, uh, muscle over here. It's got a fried egg, uh, a piece of steak. It's got a fried plantain. It's got a sausage, uh, avocado, 
It's got white rice in the back, and it's got this corn tortilla. Uh, so this plate was actually reviewed by the New York Times uh, several years ago, and the conclusion of the writer at the end that was that this food is very delicious, but it's definitely not for someone who has a high cholesterol. And I think they were right. Uh, <clears throat> this is, and my diet has gone through, through a transition uh, now, uh, but I've, I've given up all animal products. So uh, a typical dinner would be a salad um, like this with a little bit of uh, uh, sort of vinegar and oil, uh, uh, a lot of vegetables, different vegetables. Uh, there are substitutes for, if you want to eat a hamburger, for example, there are companies right now that make uh, burgers that are, that are plant-based, uh, a baked potato. You know, what's really bad about a baked potato is not the baked potato itself, but the stuff we put on the baked potato. You know, the bacon, the, uh, the cream cheese, the butter. Uh, but a, a, a baked potato in general is actually uh, not bad for you. In my house, we eat beans about twice a week. Uh, and the other two days, we eat lentils, for example. Uh, uh, fr plant plantains, uh, we, we have them often. Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with pasta, uh, particularly if it's uh, vegan pasta, you know, pasta that is just made with uh, whole wheat pasta, for example. Uh, broccoli, a typical breakfast is uh, uh, like this with a lot of fruits um, and uh, oatmeal. Uh, I changed my, my uh, coffee right now. It's just with uh, coffee and almond milk, which is the one, you know, I tried different kinds of milks. There are many milk substitutes that you can use and I, I use almond milk. And almost a salad, every, every dinner has some sort of salad because, you know, particularly green, uh, green vegetables are, are excellent for you. This is a book that was recently published by Dr. Dean Ornish, which again talks, it's called Undo It, and it talks about the power of exercise and the power of uh, self-awareness, uh, mindfulness, and, uh, and breathing and, and exercise in terms of your overall uh, health. Um, I tell patients to start informing themselves. Uh, and I hope that the, the object of this talk is not really to talk you into one form of eating and one form of behaving, but it's just to make you aware that there are things that you can do. There are changes that you can do in terms of what you do on a daily basis, in terms of what you eat, and in terms of what, uh, the foods that you buy at the supermarket and the way you cook your foods that can make a difference in your life. Uh, and they're powerful changes. There are ch those are changes that can affect your risks of cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure. So if you're not happy with the medications, if you don't want to take medications and you want to make some of these changes, I think that uh, I, I, you know, I want you to be empowered to know that there are things that you can do to change your health. And you don't necessarily have to wait for the medical system or doctors to, be, to tell you those things. In fact, if you look at the lessons we learned from smoking, uh, it took over 70,000 papers, 70,000 scientific studies for the Surgeon General to put the little warning in cigarette uh, packages uh, that were linking smoking to cancer. And for a long time, doctors were, you know, were humans. We were smoking just as much as our patients. And it took over 70,000 studies for the Surgeon General to be able to put that in the cigarette packet. And the same thing I think is gonna happen with, with nutrition. It's gonna take a long time for the medical establishment and for society in general to begin to accept some of the changes we need to make. And I think, you know, I told you a story about 100 years from now in a medical school uh, about open heart surgery. I think, I think the same thing is going to happen with, with animal uh, foods. I think 100, maybe 150, but there's going to be a time where we're going to look back and we, we're going to say our, to ourselves, what? We used to eat cow or we used to drink the mammary secretions of another mammal, which is what milk is. So I think those things are going to change. Eventually, they're going to change. 
So I tell people to begin to inform themselves. And one of the easiest ways is by looking at one of these three documentaries. Uh, what the Health uh, is one of them. Uh, the other one is Forks Over Knives. Forks Over Knives I like because it's two independent physicians, uh, one of them looking at the clinical aspect and the other one looking at that, and that's Dr. Like Colwell Esselstyn, and another one who's a biochemist, and he's looking at the biochemistry of all these foods uh, at Cornell, Dr. Colin T. Campbell, and they both eventually come to the same conclusion that the less animal uh, protein, the less animal products we eat, the better and the more, and the more healthy you're gonna be. And this, the last one is called The Game Changers, which is actually a really interesting uh, documentary that shows that even for athletes, uh, if you wanna be a top athlete, you don't have to get your protein from animals. You can get it from plants and you can just, and you can be just as big you can be just as strong. You can just be as powerful as the other athletes. Uh, and there are now many examples of major, major athletes uh, that are, that are plant-based uh, who are doing very well um, and who are sort of showing people that you can do it all through plant-based nutrition. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop with that and uh, maybe we'll take some questions and we can go over other things in more detail. But thank you for, for Dr. being Dr. Fernandez, here. I have a bunch of questions in here. Oh, great. Are you gonna, do you wanna keep sharing the screen or do you wanna? No, I, I guess I can get rid of the screen. Uh, Bob, oh. over. I can put stop share? Yeah. Okay, good. Bob, can you unmute yourself? Yep, I have. Do you want to ask the question? You want me to read it? Uh, yeah. No, my son is a neurologist, and he indicated that some 40% of post-COVID patients are experiencing neurological symptoms. I know two people uh, months after the cessation of all symptoms who experienced severe cardiac problems. One was actually a 53-year-old physician in marvelous shape with a marvelous diet. And one patient actually died from severe cardiac uh, involvement where there was really no pre-existing indication that that would be the case. Have you found that there have been cardiac problems months after uh, the cessation of all symptoms uh, from people who have had uh, the COVID? Uh, I, I think that's a great question. Uh, I, I haven't seen anyone specifically, but I'm not surprised. And you know, one of the things about COVID-19 is that there are still so many things we don't know. Uh, and in fact, one of the patients that I'll never forget was a patient uh, who was a very young patient in his early 30s, who was a construction worker. He went to work that morning feeling completely fine. Uh, and his first symptom was not being able to move the left side of his body. Uh, and he presented with a stroke. In fact, uh, the first test he had was a CT scan of the head and then they scanned the chest and he saw, they saw that he had the, the typical changes that you would expect of someone with COVID. And I got involved because one of the things we did at Northwell was to go around different hospitals and put patient, people on ECMO. That's the artificial lung so that we could bring him back to, to North Shore. And he had a massive, massive stroke and he actually was able to survive, but, but he spent four months in the hospital uh, until he was actually able to, to actually walk out, walk out of the hospital, uh, but very, very weak. And I think that, you know, as a medical specialty, I, I think it's important for all of us to be humble in terms of, of how we treat these patients, to know that there are things that we don't understand. And one of the things that, has, that we have learned is that there is this propensity towards forming little clots uh, in, the, in the arteries. And as, you, and as I show you some of the pictures, the arteries that go to the heart are tiny. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if that, that state of uh, propensity to form little clots can affect those arteries and you can have patients with uh, formation of those little clots and, 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 and have decreased heart function based on that. Thank you. You're welcome.
Next question, Kathy Araman. Are you are you here? You want to unmute yourself? Kathy? Let's see if she's still on. She asks, is a is a fatal V fib preventable? So the uh, the final event that kills people in general is what, what we call ventricular fibrillation. That's V fib. Now, VFib, you know, when, when you look at the heart and the heart squeezes, it's a very coordinated motion, sort of squeezes like this, uh, so that the blood gets into the heart and the heart squeezes and it pumps the blood out through the aortic valve into the aorta and it goes to the rest of your body. But it's a very coordinated motion. Uh, in ventricular fibrillation, what happens is that that coordinated movement of the muscle goes into a tremor, almost like a spasm or like a seizure of the heart. And the heart just squeezes very rapidly in a very uncoordinated way so that the blood can move forward and it just stays in the heart. That is in general how people die. That is like the, the last event that occurs in general. Uh, and that's why one of the treatments for anyone uh, is to, for, you know, if, if there are the automatic defibrillators, to shock them. Uh, and, and that can actually save lives if you're able to shock them right away because that's the treatment for ventricular fibrillation. Okay, Michelle McMath, do you want to ask a question? Michelle? No, how about you? How about okay. you? Uh, can you address the confusion about high cholesterol and whether or not it is highly significant? Uh, I appear to have acquired this generically and have both high IDL and HDL. My diet is mostly plant-based. At what point, if any, is medication involved? Yeah, so, you know, it, it is, it is uh, something that has been out there for, for several years. In fact, I think it was in 2012, 2013, it got into the media uh, that, uh, in fact, the cover of Time Magazine had a picture of a of, I think a, a, an egg, a fried egg, and it said that uh, butter, butter is back uh, and uh, bacon is back and so on and so forth, uh, with the idea that, that uh, dietary cholesterol does not increase uh, serum cholesterol. Uh, and that was from a study that was really uh, sponsored by the uh, uh, meat industry where, and the egg industry where they showed that if your cholesterol was already high and you added one egg to your diet, that that egg wouldn't really make a significant difference because your cholesterol was already high. But I think in general, the uh, uh, multiple studies have shown that dietary cholesterol affects your serum cholesterol. And it does make a difference uh, because if you look at big studies of cardiovascular disease, for example, one of them is called the Framingham study. And you look at that study, uh, there are very, very few people with total cholesterols less than 150 who have heart attacks. Uh, so it, it, it does make a difference. Uh, plants have zero cholesterol. There, there's absolutely no cholesterol in plants. So going on a whole food plant-based diet is definitely going to decrease your cholesterol. Um, the, uh, you know, the ratio is important. So the uh, having, if your total cholesterol comes down, uh, particularly your, your, your bad cholesterol, then having a low HDL is not as significant, um, but uh, you should definitely aim to have your, your total cholesterol uh, be as low as possible and definitely your LDL cholesterol, that's the bad cholesterol. You know, I tell everyone that they should know a number as they know the social security number. Everyone should know their LDL cholesterol. It should be less than 100. But if you have a, a family history of risk factors for coronary artery disease, it should definitely be less than 70. If you're on a whole food plant-based diet that is low in oils and you're still not there, then I would recommend uh, medications. That's interesting because I was just retested and I was told that because the ratio is good and because the HDL is 80, that 
the 147 LDL doesn't matter. It, like they would put me on medication unless there were other significant risk factors considering, you know, that everything else is good and the diet is good and the weight is good and yeah. blood pressure is great. And so it's, it's confusing to me because my grandmother was over 300. My mother was already over 240 before she went on medication. So, I I, but she had bad HDL. And you don't have any other risk factors? Not that I know of. I mean, there's yeah. some cardiac disease with my father and grandfather as they got older, like late seventies, early eighties, but my father's not a great eater. My grandfather had a stroke late and he lived for a while, but otherwise no, but parents hypertension. I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to look for a, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to look for a diagnosis here. I was just wondering if, if how it played into it. I was, it, I was surprised. It, like, I mean, I'm not, I'm really not sure which way to go with it. Yeah, I think if you have no, and it seems like you don't really have significant risk factors, I think that's appropriate. You know, the one test that I would do would be a, 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 a calcium score. I think if, if you have a calcium score and that calcium score is, is, is low, then uh, I think that uh, you, you should feel completely safe that your, your heart's going to be fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Gerald asked a question, is Greek yogurt considered a heart healthy food if its main casein is its main protein? No, I think anything that has dairy uh, has that, that has those, that protein profile, which is highly inflammatory, uh, which is highly, uh, you know, the, the and it's not just that the protein profile, but it's the other things that come from dairy. And one of them, for example, is the steroids. Uh, and even if they tell you that, that the animals were not raised in, with additional steroids, uh, the, the animals already have their own very high potent steroids, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a pregnant cow. So it, 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 they're gonna have a very high concentration of different steroids. That, that are designed to grow a baby calf from being very little to being over, uh, you know, 400 pounds in just a few months. So uh, I think that uh, they, they have, the yogurts have the same problem. Can I ask you then, how can a woman get enough calcium from plants? Yeah, I think that's a great question and it comes up all the time and in fact, if you look at the countries that have the highest number of osteoporosis and the number highest and the highest number of fractures, it's always the countries that eat the most uh, uh, animal products and that drink the most dairy. Uh, the way we get calcium, you know, calcium comes is a mineral. It comes from the soil, and the way the cow gets it is from the plants. So if you go to the plants, you go into the direct source of calcium. Uh, so there's no need to use the inter intermedi intermediary of, of the milk uh, or the other uh, products from animals to get the calcium. So you will get enough calcium by eating uh, a, a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, and, and there are many, particularly of the green vegetables that are very high in calcium. Thank you. Okay, Andrew asked, where does yogurt and red wine fit into the whole foods diet? Also, where does fish fit in to the whole foods plant-based diet? They don't fit in. <laughs> so, so fish, uh, I, I do tell people that if they absolutely have to eat something from the meat category to eat uh, fish, uh, meaning that I, I, I feel that fish is uh, better than than uh, chicken and it's better than definitely than definitely red meat is the worst because red meat is considered uh, particularly processed red meat is considered a class 1a carcinogen by the World Health Organization uh, and there are a lot of studies that have linked processed meat to uh, particularly to rectal cancer and to colon cancer uh, so so if I was going to have any meat uh, I would have uh, uh, fish. In fact, that's what, that's what I did, you know, for about a year. Uh, when I first started doing this, uh, there was about a year where I, I would have fish here and there. 
because there are two barriers. There are two main barriers when you try to do this. One of them is going to be uh, the social aspect. You're going to find yourself to be a little bit of an outcast. Every time you, you visit your family, every time you go out with friends. In fact, there were so many times where I almost felt embarrassed to ask the, the waiter or the waitress uh, to bring me uh, you know, vegetables and I wasn't going to have the steak with my friends and stuff. Now I, I've got the opposite. Now I'm a, I think I'm a little, I'm a little bit annoying when, when I, when I sort of proudly say that I'm vegan and, and I order my, and I, I don't order my steak and I order other stuff. But that's one of the things that, that you're going to have to get accustomed to. Uh, and the other one that you, that another barrier is that a, a lot of times you have to make sure that you're eating enough uh, because, you know, plant-based meals definitely have less calories than, than all the other uh, fat and, and, and all the other meats uh, that are out there. So you're going to have to make sure that you're eating enough calories so you don't find times where you're just weak because you're, you're just not eating enough. Uh, and the problem with yogurt, again, is that it, it is, it's dairy uh, and it has a lot of the problems that, that I talked about before with the dairy uh, products. Unless you do the other types of yogurts, right? The coconut, that's and right. cashew, and those, right? That's right. Maureen asked a question. Please comment on the role of niacin as a treatment of high cholesterol. Uh, so there, there are, I think there are some powerful medications for treatment of high cholesterol, and they're getting better and better and better. Uh, niacin is very good. You know, the statins are very good. Uh, there are also right now medications that are injectable, which can bring your LDL to really, really low levels. Uh, and uh, there, there, you know, there are two of them that are available right now. Uh, they're being studied in terms of their overall uh, uh, ability to reduce uh, cardiovascular events, uh, but they definitely can bring your LDL down. And they're injectable, patients get them, you know, you get an injection, I think, either once a month or one, once every two weeks. Okay, the next question had to do with statins. Susanna asked, please comment on statins. Is it controversial? No, uh, statins are, are, you know, statins is one of the most commonly pres prescribed medications. It's the first line of treatment for patients that have high cholesterol that can be treated with, uh, with lifestyle changes and, and nutrition. Uh, and they go on statins. They work very well. Unfortunately, there are a lot, there are a lot of people who have uh, side effects, uh, particularly muscle pain, sometimes liver issues with statins. So you have to be monitored for those things. Uh, but statins can, uh, can work very well in reducing uh, your total cholesterol and your LDL cholesterol. Okay, Mary has a question. Uh, Mary, do you want to ask it? Sure. Um, I know there are calcium tests that uh, give a very good picture of um, the, the um, risk that you have from vascular disease. Is there some reason that's not done more frequently? It, it seems like you almost have to ask for it. Nobody's offering it. You're, you're right. You're 100% right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we should be doing it more often. You know, it, it probably every, because it's a very quick test. There are no side effects, you know, it's just a, a very quick test. They just give you a calcium score. Uh, and uh, if it's very low, uh, it gives you that sense of comfort. Uh, hmm. and, and if it's high, then it shows you that you, you need to be more aggressive about uh, that some of the things that you're doing. Uh, so, you know, that's why it's important to be informed and, and, uh, and, and you know, tell your doctor that you want, you want to know your calcium score and you want to go for the test. So it, it, would it be something that if you have high cholesterol um, and being treated for it, that you should ask to have that done? Yeah. Okay. I, I, uh, Is it a blood yeah. test? You can tell them that Fernandez said, said it. <laughs> Is it a blood test? She, uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a radiologic test. So it's a, oh. yes, they put you in the machine and, and it's like a CAT scan of your heart. Okay. Uh, another question about red wine in the plant-based diet. Is that 
not included or? Yeah, absolutely. Red wine, white wine, all wines are, are grapes. So Good. they are in the uh, whole food plant-based diet. Uh, and, uh, you know, they've actually studied what is it about wine that has been associated in many studies to be good for your heart and to reduce your blood pressure and to uh, just make you feel better. You know, is it the alcohol, for example? And they've actually, what they determined is that is, is the, uh, the, the pigments, the color pigments in the wine, and that's why red wine is better than white wine, that, that, are, that are good for you. And, you know, if you look at all the uh, whole food plant-based nutrition, a lot of the things that, that are good for you are colorful. You know, all the fruits are colorful, uh, you know, the green vegetables. So there's a lot of color and there's a lot of protective uh, substances, phytochemicals that are in those colors that are good uh, for your body in, in, in just many ways. Okay, two more questions and then we'll, we'll finish up. Uh, Fred asks, what is the value of a nuclear stress test? Yeah, so a nuclear stress test is a test where uh, you basically, uh, the doctor has confirmed that there are some blockages in the coronary arteries of your heart, that there are some parts of your heart that may not be moving as well as other parts of your heart. And the doctor wants to know whether those parts that are not moving well whether they can still be uh, salvaged and whether they're still viable. And that's where they do a nuclear stress test to see whether those parts of the heart uh, are still uh, viable, uh, meaning that they're still alive and that they still can be saved. Okay. Uh, Charlotte asks, what about people with diverticulosis and have to limit fresh foods and nuts and seeds. Yeah, so uh, if you think about diverticulosis and the reason you have diverticulosis to begin with is all related to not eating enough fiber. So, you know, it's funny because people always talk about protein, protein, protein. And, you know, we all Americans eat more than enough protein in any kind of diet. In fact, I have never, ever, ever seen any patient in America go to the hospital with a protein deficiency. You know, you see this in like third world countries where people just don't eat enough, but not in America. Everyone eats enough protein. What we don't eat is enough fiber. Uh, and, uh, you know, people should, I think the average intake of fiber in the American diet, I think on average is less than 10 grams and it should be at least 50, 60, and the higher it is, the better. And, and if you don't have enough fiber, you get constipation. And when you get constipation, that's when you get diverticulosis, which are these little outpouchings of mucosa in the, in the colon, particularly in the, what we call the sigmoid colon, which is the part of the colon right before uh, the rectum. Uh, and you get these outpouchings which can give you problems with pain. The pain is typically in the left lower quadrant of your abdomen, and it can give you, or you can have bleeding episodes or episodes of inflammation of those outpouchings. And in fact, one of the treatments is that when you go to the doctor, they'll send you this uh, fiber uh, uh, liquids, fiber sort of substances, uh, which is okay, but it's not as good as natural fiber that can come from whole food plants. And I can assure you 100% that if you have a whole food plant-based nutrition, you will never ever have a problem with diverticulosis or, or with, uh, or with uh, uh, constipation. And therefore, and then you don't have to, you, don't, you're, you're, you won't care about seeds and you won't care about uh, nuts. Because you know, they told you that you can't eat seeds and, and nuts when you have those outpatients because the nuts can get stuck in there and it can give you that inflammation. So if you do have the diverticulosis, I, I, I would do that. Uh, but the, the most important part is to prevent that diverticulosis uh, from the start. Okay, someone else, a couple of people. I yes. was told to eat an egg a day in order to start my day with protein. My cholesterol is fine, opinion of this? Yeah, I, uh, 
you know, the, uh, I think the, the egg is still concentrated animal protein. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's still very high in, in cholesterol. Uh, and overall, I think that the, the lower the level of cholesterol, the better. Uh, so for example, if uh, an LDL, you know, if, if you look at, at our LDL when we're young, it's, you know, it's very low. It's probably in the 30s or 40s, and it creeps up as we age. So there's the, the lower your LDL cholesterol, the better. And then someone asked about egg whites. What about egg whites? Uh, you know, the egg whites do not have as much cholesterol. Well, they don't have the cholesterol, but they still have the, the, the same concentration and profile of protein mm -hmm. uh, that, that are in, in, in animal protein. Uh, and, and the problem with animal protein is that the, it, it has a set of amino acids that are, have been associated with, with uh, some types of cancer. Last question, Kathy asks, is a cardiac PET scan superior to a calcium test? Uh, they're a little bit different. Uh, the PET scan is very similar to the uh, nuclear stress test. Uh, so they're more to look at uh, viability of the heart uh, as opposed to the calcium score, which is more to look at, your, at, at the hardening of the arteries. Uh, that's where the calcium score really uh, is better than, than the PET scan. That. Okay, I think that wraps it up. We had a lot of questions, a lot of good. Any last minute questions? Anybody want to raise their hand? No? All right, well, thank you so much for doing this for Ollie. This was really informative. I think everyone really enjoyed it. There's a lot of comments coming in, thanking you for your lecture, change their outlook. Yeah, thank you. And, and again, you know, the, the goal of the lecture, I think is for you to uh, be aware that there are things that you can do to really uh, change uh, your, your life in terms of your risk profile for some of these chronic conditions that sometimes we think they're, they're not reversible. And that includes, you know, even Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, right now, uh, if you reach the age of 85, there's almost a 50% incidence of some form of, of, of severe dementia. Uh, and there's a lot of data that shows the saturated fat is associated with that. So there's a lot of chronic conditions that are affected by how we eat. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you, Bruce. I enjoyed. Thank you, too.